As we dive deep into thousands of years of history, it's important to note a few things. First and foremost, that the right to self-determination of Armenians in Artsakh does not depend solely on the ancient indigenous history of our people, but more on their basic human rights. We don't need to prove the history in order to claim their right to determine their fate in society in Artsakh. But that being said, the history does support the Armenians, which is why Turkey and Azerbaijan have made a huge effort to destroy the physical history and revise their textbooks, and this is why it's important for all of you to know the facts. But history can be complicated. It's important to know history because it helps us comprehend the world around us and who we are. So by looking at genealogy, archaeology, linguistics, geography, and the historical records, we can piece together what really happened. This will be a surface-level approach to dissecting the history of Artsakh and its people over the millennia, and we will continue our discussions on Artsakh in the coming episodes. My name is Haig Minasyan, and you're listening to Haituk Talks, and today we will explore the story of Artsakh. A couple of Armenians talking in the world. The Armenian homeland is a mountainous one. Hayots Lernashkar, as we call it, aka the Armenian Highlands, which for most of history has been designated as the geographical name of the region in which Armenians inhabited, even while under foreign domain. This is the mountain ranges between the Mediterranean, Caspian, and Black Seas, essentially, north of the Middle East today, south of the Caucasus. Geography is destiny. This is a classic phrase. This phrase can mean a lot for the Armenian. Our mountainous environment determined in many ways who we would become as an identity and culture. Because of these mountains, abundant water from the creeks and rivers and volcanic soil made it an ideal place to settle down. Bake some lavash, ferment some wine, as my mom calls it, prime real estate, which is why everyone wanted to come and <laughs> hang out with us. Lots of metals all around us, made us some of the earliest metal workers and craftsmen in the world, a tradition and skill that has been passed down till this day, you could say, since we have a lot of friends who are jewelers, right? And you can even find in Artsakh these old craftsmen works of amulets and figurines back from the Urartu age, before Cyrus the Great. Not to mention our love of rocks. Armenians love rocks. <laughs> Whether it's a cross stone, a khachkar, a temple, church, or a fort, we built a lot of things in our time, many of which can still be found throughout the ruins of Western Armenia, Armenia the Republic, and Artsakh today. And last but not least, the isolated mountaintops and valleys which were ideal for avoiding danger, raiders, or invading armies, so what I want the listener to keep in mind as you learn more about the details of Artsakh's history and the region's history in general is the fact that we are our mountains. We are mountain people. The Artsakhsi, the Armenian, who they became and who they are today are directly related to their indigenous land. The Armenian population were literally the cavemen who then came out of the cave and worked together to begin the first civilization in this region. The Armenian population on any map will show that wherever the isolated clifftops and hard-to-get valleys are is where the Armenians were able to survive and prosper. So Artsakh is a prime example of the Armenian story and evolution. And with me here today to discuss about Artsakh's history is our very good friend, Chris Khachadur, who studied history at the University of California, Irvine, and is an avid Armenian history researcher and fellow nerd. Oh, welcome, Chris. Hi, everyone. Happy to have you here. Happy to be here. Yo, I love talking to you about history things. This is going to be great. A lot of fun. Um, but like I was mentioning before, Chris, I love looking at geography. Um, I like looking at language as well to help make sense of Armenia and history in general. But I know you've done more reading and research on the genealogical side of things. Could you tell us a little bit about the genetic findings from recent research on Armenians and Artsakh in particular and how they go about it? So Armenians, and especially those of Artsakh, are really old. I mean, these people have been here, as you said, since the caveman times. Yeah. Once the glaciers retreated with the Ice Age, these people were the first to be here, and they've been there. They never left. Yeah. Um, so what we know is that for about 8,000 years, we have a genetic continuity in this yeah. region. Modern the Armenians formed a distinct genetic identity around 2500 BC, which corresponds to the theory of Haik the right. patriarch. Between 2000 3000 BC. Yeah, it's Armenian about 5,000 years ago. Right. Uh, but we do know that from 52 samples of ancient skeletons that 
people have been living in the same spot for about 8,000 years. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and then how do they go about doing these studies? So they'll find fragments of ancient skeletons and burial mounds and sites, one of which is Arzokh, which is in Hadrut, formerly part of Arzakh, now it's under Azerbaijani control yeah. since October. Um, they would find pieces of teeth or jaw bones or femurs, so kind of dense bones, and see if they can extract any genetic um, traces. And do you think the geography of Armenia, though, to take it back to geography, has played a part in the genetic development? Yeah, I mean, we think of Armenians and we say, oh, look, they look so distinct. There's so many different types. What does an Armenian look like? Right. And we think, oh, it must be because of, like, this guy came, the Mongol, this, right, yeah, that. And this it's influence, like, yeah. Yeah, but it's not actually not that. Um, when we have 20 wide DNA haplogroups, about 13 are found in Armenia, so paternal DNA. So mm -hmm. they have been diversified internally, not externally. Their distinct groups are not a result of modern-day migrations, but of ancient tribes that had settled there thousands of years ago that never left. From what I remember from those studies, it was saying, like, around 1000 BC or 2000 is when, like, it stopped mixing or whatever. It started, so, yeah, 1200 yeah. BC is when they say Armenians kind of stopped taking in foreign influence, which corresponds to the Bronze Age collapse. Makes sense. Where Assyria, the Hittites, they all kind of disappeared. Mycenae, Greece, just gone. I mean, so but why I don't like the genetic test particularly is because, you know, uh, Turks and Azeris and everybody can take their own genetic tests and it then shows that they have a very close genetic makeup like us, you know, then they try to prove their indigenousness this way, etc. Uh, what does that mean for other groups in the area like Azerbaijan who claim a shared Turkic identity but then have a similar genetic makeup, let's say? Yeah, I mean, for one, Azerbaijanis are largely indigenous to the region in terms of their ancestry. The people who they are now have been the people who live there but their uh, identity yeah that's where it gets complex because they identify as being turkic and speaking a turkic language which is even that heavily persian influenced um but they are not actually turkic in right. terms of ethnicity they are largely the indigenous people who have been assimilated and have been taken upon this turkish identity turkic shia mm -hmm. muslim identity over time over time and so if you have an azerbaijani or turk who shares genetic similarities with Armenians, it's most likely that their ancestors were, in fact, Armenians who simply over time lost their language and their religion and became what is now modern-day Turks and Azerbaijanis. That makes sense. Um, I mean, that makes sense because they look just like us. They eat the same foods. Their 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 music is similar. And yeah. uh, a lot of these have nothing to do with your genetics or your uh, identity, but it's regional. It's more similar to our culture and Georgian culture mm -hmm. and local culture than it is to it's Central Asian, Central Asian Turkic Siberian culture, cultures. Which is odd when there's that, you know, Turkic connection they're trying to make when most of their culture is more regionally local. based in local yeah. uh, Anatolia, Caucasus, right? Um, well, to begin with Artsakh, uh, like I'd like to make a few notes on their language, first of all. For me, language uh, is, a, is my favorite identifier of identity and ethnicity because it's what your mother spoke in your house and their mother spoke in their house and it just continued that's why we call it a mother tongue i guess but um strabo this greek philosopher and geographer back in the first century bc attested that up until the kura river which is in the middle of azerbaijan today i guess you could say yeah um this was all under the armenian kingdom and it was monolingual now i don't think they were all speaking only armenian but it means that there was being armenian spoken up until that point which includes artsakh today um and then you know 900 years later in the or 800 years later in the 8th century armenian historian stepanos sunetsi was the first one to mention the dialect of artsakh now, I think they're, you know, every region had their own dialect, and so that's what he could be commenting on. Um, but the prominent linguist Hrachia, Hrachia Ajarian, you know, more recently, uh, attests the dialect of Harabakh to start developing in the 12th century when the Turkic people started arriving. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, what parts of Eastern Armenia was this Harabakh Artsakh dialect being spoken mostly? So the Gharabagh dialect was spoken in historically what was Artsakh, Sunik, and Udik, the three northeastern provinces of historic Armenia. So modern day Artsakh, but the territories all around it, like Ganja, Barda, and Azerbaijan, but also Sunik, so Goris, Kapan, and Tavush region in northern Armenia, northeastern Armenia, which formed like a northeastern belt of Armenians. So the eastern Armenia, for, yeah. Uh, could you give us um, examples of like 
what the Kharabakh dialect might sound. So for one thing, always add a H in front of every word of the yeah. vowel. <laughs> so inch would be hinch, vons, or inch best would be hons or hunts. Um, yeah. Ov is hu, which is like English. Um, other words are, let's say for I don't know, is yudumchum, which in standard Eastern is chikidem. Oh, there you go. Um, anger is hanger. Na petsen kral arachin Wikipedia ya kombo step hanager. Yes, it uh, agumba hamagar kesem. I think koko otsa swords nesem hambagrel swords nesem. Hunsa Wikipedia ni matnin hunsa hodvas nertinin hunsa anin ammen hinch war pezi inin shat kartvats u shat tevekatsvats hinch shat kare vora meng 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 vadarum. That was an audio piece from Wikipedia's Wikitongues channel on YouTube. In this video, Irina speaks in her native Artsakh dialect about her involvement with Wikipedia. You can hear a few of the words Chris mentioned in the Artsakh dialect. So speaking of language, you know, I want to get into now the ethnonym of Artsakh and Karabakh. So Karabakh came on came a little later, right? It's a yeah. Turkic Persian word. What is it? The it's translation. Uh, so Karabakh or Karabakh is Combining two different words, kara or gharav, in a Turkic root meaning black, right. and bagh, which is the Persian root for garden. Yeah. Um, so garabagh or gharabagh means black garden. I feel like that like just goes to show again like the ethnogenesis of the Azeri, yeah. uh, which is this Persian-Turkish combo. Um, I mean, Turco-Persian right. is like a thing in yeah. historical records. Like, right. You know, the and Seljuks were also Turco-Persian. They wrote in Persian, but they spoke Turkish. The Ottomans, I mean, it's all, all came from, yeah, it's... Uh, what's really Turkic about it? Persian anymore. is a literary language of the Islamic world outside of Arabia. Right. <laughs> Arabic maybe took over afterwards, but Farsi and even Greek, to a certain point, were these lingua franca, right? Like the yeah. language of the I world. I mean, in Central Asia and Iranian plateau, you had Persian being the official language yeah. that was written down. No no other language was written down there. It's true. Um, so, Kharapagh is this uh, is Black Garden, but that came later on. 13th century. Yeah, the like, Mongols you know, arrived. way longer. Uh, but before that, I mean, Artsakh, when was it first uh, jotted down as a province of the historic Armenian land? So, it's debatable. What we do know is that the Urartians who lived in the 9th to 6th centuries BC mention a region along their fringes, and they call it by different names in different times, different records, be it Ardakh, Urdekhe, Urtekhini, Atakhuni. Sounds very similar to Artsakh. Yeah. And, I mean, Artsakh itself is a very ancient word. What, is, what does Artsakh mean? So, the, it's a, most likely a compound word. So, Ar and Tsakh. Tsakh, we know, means like a thicket or forest area. Is, Ar, it, is it classical Armenian Tsakh? Probably? Yes. Yeah, right? Okay. It's no longer used in spoken Armenian, but it's, it's no, literary. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Ar is a more interesting word here. Yeah, the Ar theory, whatever. Oh, yeah. That. So, Ar is found in a lot of Armenian words. So, for example, Aryuds and Ardziv, Lion and Eagle, both have the word Ar in it, and Ar. those are our national animals. Arka, which is king, yeah. and then uh, Ararat and Armenia, and Arakads. all these yeah, Arakads, and uh, Aryun, which is blood. I mean, even Armen, Armen. Like our a- ancient tribe, Armenia. Um, it sounds like anything important almost, or anything that has to do with like government or God or, divine. you know, divine, like, has... I mean, Ararich, the creator, it's, again, Ar. Yeah, if you, like, the more you look into it, you guys, like, you'll see that there's this big, uh, especially in ancient Armenian uh, yeah. words and locations, this uh, prefix of Ar is seen everywhere. So that would make sense to me. Ar having to do with Armenia, probably, and Sakh as in, um, like, a description of the, the region. Some say it's actually from Aran. Who is like a descendant of Sisak, who, the found, who founded the Sunni dynasty, right. and he was made the first ruler of this region. Some say it's from Ardashes, who conquered the region in the sev- second century BC. So All of which have theories. the AR in, yeah. <laughs> in there. Ardashes, anyway. and even the first king of Urartu, Arame, right. had his capital in Arzashkun. Yeah. So <laughs> and his son was Argishti or whatever. Yeah. So, uh, Chris, I know each province of Armenia, the kingdom of Armenia, had like a number. Do you know what number the Artsakh province was? This is like 10 or 12 or something. I think it's 12, yeah. Yeah, 12. So, Artsakh is like a, you know, is a province of historic Armenia. They call them Ashkars now, right? Ashkar, yeah. Uh, yeah, Ashkar was, which means world, but they used it for their term for like the Artsakh Ashkar province, province right? Um, so, then what happened afterwards? the coming centuries. So the Urartians eventually disappeared from what we know from the historical record and the Achaemenids, the Persians and the Medians came to the scene 
And so from 570 till 331 BC, you had Armenia as a satrap, your province of the Iranian Empire, ruled by local kings who had the last name Yervanduni or Orontid in Greek. Mm-hmm. And then came the Yervandunis themselves who kind of declared themselves independent after Alexander the Great came to the region. And then you had Ardashesians who fully solidified their rule over the region. And Ardashesians had one famous king, King Dikran the Great, mm-hmm. who founded four cities after himself, naming them Dikran Agert, meaning built by Dikran, one of which was along the frontier of Artsakh Udik. Today, it is no longer part of the Armenian-controlled region as right. of a few days ago. But it was, and we were excavating it, and it, you can see pictures online. It's an amazing, like, preserved city almost. Yeah, you can almost. see it from satellite. Yeah, you can see how, you know, and this is just one of the four, that, and the only one that was actually within our grasp. Yeah. Right? Um, and, yeah, as of recent, it's been taken over to the Azerbaijani side, and who as knows of, what... As of November 20th, actually, uh, and yesterday. Who, yeah, and who knows what they're going to call it and how they're going to revise that history. I'm curious to what their attempt is going to be. Um, so, if you go to Stepanagir today, too, they have that coin museum mm-hmm. of the ancient Armenian coins, and so they have their uh, bunch of, you know, coins from these eras... From the ground that they found around there, proving you know this Armenian statehood and the the yeah. kingdoms that uh, existed in this area for the longest time, and we talk in centuries here, you know, but think about the last century that we've been kind of you know aware of, five hundred years of an Armenian kingdom, you know, is a long time for Armenians to you know grow a population and establish yeah. themselves there. Uh, so we can you know Armenians were all over the place in these regions. But we also had a neighbor who I'd like us to talk about, the Caucasian Albanians, um, right? Yeah. Um, the, I guess the Caucasian Albanians, they most likely had some populations in Artsakh, more so in Udik. The lower lands outside of the, the mountains. The lands east and north of Artsakh proper, right? which is where they most likely had some populations. Because I mean, So who are they? Do they speak? What do they speak? And so they speak who do they pray to? A <laughs> Northeast Caucasian language, or they spoke a Northeast Caucasian language, right. related to languages of Monte Dagestan, Chechnya, Ingushetia, but closest to the Lesgian languages right. in northern mm-hmm. Azerbaijan. Yeah, these people still kind of live in northern live Azerbaijan. There, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but only one of these groups or tribes, if you will, got the Udin, speak a language that is closest to Albanian, Caucasian. Which Albanian. is the name of our region for exactly. that area, right? Ud- Udik. Udik, right? the K in Armenian, the K symbol- symbolizes plural. Right. So, Haik, Virk, Arvank. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Udik was the land of the Udi. Um, and these people are still Christian. They were members of the Armenian Apostolic Church up until the 1980s. When, so, you know, yeah, so they were Christian. So uh, these are these Albanian tribes, and you know, not necessarily connected to the Albania in Europe. First of all, no relation. Yeah, <laughs> no relation, just by name. Uh, we call them Ahvank or uh, right Ahvans yeah. in Armenian, which is some Ahvansi. Ahvansi. And, uh, you know, they were this the northern nation to our northeast throughout Armenian history, very closely tied in terms of culture and at religion at one point when we both became yeah. Christianized around the same time, right? 314. 314. And so um, they were, so you'll find uh, the history of Albania most well recorded within Armenian books, first of all. Uh, yeah. They've been a neighbor of ours in ancient times for a long time, but uh, what happened to them? There's not that many today, right? There's like 10,000 Udis There's left. 10,000 Udis left. But if you count the Lesgans and whatnot, there's millions. Maybe, yeah. I mean, one interesting fact is that the Albanians were Christianized by the Armenians, by the Ashagoni kings. So St. Gregory the Illuminator sent his grandson, Gregoris, to Albania to preach Christianity. He was killed in a village in modern-day Dagestan called Nugdi, but his body was brought back to Armenia, to Artsakh, and buried at Amaras Monastery. Which is, like, what do we have that control? We have that? control of it, it was confirmed As of right a few now. days ago. Right. Um, it will be in the Armenian-Russian peacekeeping area. So we have a 3rd, 4th century tomb, essentially, yeah. to Grigor Lusavurich's his grandson. grandson. <laughs> <laughs> in the Amaras, was like the first Armenian school. Yeah, right? that, this was in like the 340s, I think, when he passed away, 343, if I'm not mistaken. And then in 405, when Mesut Amashtots created the Armenian alphabet, he opened the first school at this Amaras monastery. Not only is a classroom still there where they taught the monks, but also St. Gregorius' tomb is visible. You can visit it underneath the main church. So when we talk about the Artsakh dialect, first of all, I mean, the, the Armenian language was almost even... Uh, sh- first taught there, so it must yeah, have been framed it, by it as It was well, shaped yeah. there and everything. It, it has a very vital like you know, place in 
the development of oh, our yeah. language and everything. And uh, didn't so Mesrob Mashtots created the Armenian alphabet 405 and then also helped the Georgians and the Albanians, correct? Yeah. So the Caucasian Albanian alphabet was created on the same time, some say around 420, 425. Um, the only written records of it were found in a, the St. Catherine's Monastery in Mount Sinai in Egypt. Right. Um, by accident, by the way. Well, they thought, they were like seeing the letters. They're like, what letters are these? Yeah, they look kind Armenian, of Armenian, but it's, not. but it's not reading out to be Armenian. And exactly. then they figured out like, oh, this could be the lost Caucasian language Albanian. of the Albanians, you know? Because it seemed like they disappeared out of nowhere, right? And then it's only now that we're trying to yeah. piece it back together. Um, what happened to the Albanians? So... In 387, it's a really important year, Artsakh and Udik are given to Caucasian Albania. Other regions are also separated from Armenia by the Russia, by the sorry, the Romans <laughs> and the Persians. All these names. And, uh, uh, the Romans and Persians give Artsakh and Udik to Albania. Right. So here's a problem. Albania itself was barely forming a Christian identity with a new alphabet. And at this time, basically, they were given two large populated provinces of Armenians who had a distinct identity. Uh, that makes sense. And I see where you're going with it. So not only was their religion given by Armenians, their new alphabet was given by Armenians, they took in a large Armenian population and yeah. basically became Armenian-operated. Their institutions, their church and statehood apparatus were all controlled by Armenians. Makes sense. And so what, like most of them eventually are menophied and like assimilated to being Armenian and then maybe a little bit of other people too. So those who lived west of the Kur or Kura River, so on Artsakh and Udik, were already large Armenian by this point. And even their capital was moved from the east to the west, across the Kur, in 552, to Parta, which is modern-day Barda. Mm -hmm. So that really solidified the Armenianness of their state. Um, and their language stopped being written and spoken by the 8th century, which is also when a large number of Arab tribes moved into the flatlands of what is now Azerbaijan, slaughtered and replaced these Caucasian Armenian tribes, those who survived did so in the north, on the southern slopes of the Caucasus, northern Azerbaijan, and were largely Georgianized, actually. The Kakhati, yeah. I mean, again, to survive, they had to live in these mountaintops to, exactly. to, to keep away. So uh, it's something I've noticed in general. If you look around the world, wherever it was flat, those populations tended to assimilate a lot yeah. quicker. than, And that's why I think the Caucasus, first of all, is so diverse, is because so many different communities were able different to be mountains. isolated and keep away from each other or invaders. But um, so... Artsakh is under the Persian Empire at this point, right? Let's say we're going, or no, the Arabs came, you said? Well, first the Persians. The Persians took over Armenia in 428 until 645 when the Arabs were like, oh, you know, now it's ours. Our turn, yeah. Um, so the Arabs established an emirate, which was run by a Muslim emir, but also an Armenian prince of princes, Ishkhan Atz Ishkhan, who kind of co-ruled. Um, Artsakh was part of this domain. Interesting. Um, and when Arab rule began to collapse in the 9th century, a prince in Artsakh, who had ties to the Albanian and Armenian monarchies, um, declared the new principality called Khachen in 821. And Khachen lays a foundation for what becomes later on the kingdom of Artsakh in the year 1000. And See. what's interesting is that in the 10th century, the Byzantine emperor Constantine VII actually refers to the prince, saying the prince of Khachen, Armenia. Yeah. So it was basically, it's proof that Khachen or Artsakh was part of Armenia and was recognized as such by international players such as the Byzantine Emperor. Right. Uh, so the Principality of Khachen, which later became the Kingdom of Khachen, this, it was a uh, like a, a it was a lordship it was under another empire and then it became relatively independent for a, a, a period of time and then uh what the, the turks came 1060 well yes yeah, so, there already <laughs> so from 821 to the year 1000 it was basically a small principality under the pakradonis of ani and then in 1000 right. they were recognized as independent kings they kept that title until 1261 when the mongols said you know what we're going to make you guys the little princes so they were lowered to the status of princes of Khachen. We have a lot of monasteries and you know works of uh, you know art all over Artsakh. Mm -hmm. Which era do you think a lot of those came from? Was it this uh, was this period before or after? So many are from this period. So Ganzasar and Dadivank were built by these people. Their origins are a lot older. Like for example, Dadivank was built in the first century yeah. over the tomb of Dadi, who was a disciple of the Apostle Thaddeus. God. Um, and his tomb is there um, under the main altar of the church. Also, Katarovank was built in the 4th century in Hadrut now under Azerbaijani occupation. Mm -hmm. Besides that, the major churches and monasteries were built in that time period under the Khachan dynasty. 
um, so 9th to 13th centuries. Yeah. Um, in general, you had a huge Armenian renaissance in that period. The medieval times. The Zakarians yeah. rebuilt Arbat, Sanahin, Kerard, and even Cilicia. A lot of monasteries were built then, too. No, that we had an Armenian renaissance around that time, and the Artsakhs are like literally one of the top spots. Oh, yeah. yeah it's huge. There's thousands of these things. Um, so uh, the Seljuks arrived, 1060? Seljuks arrived. I mean, 1016 is when the first Turkic bands arrive in the southern portions of Armenia. But by 1064, they had taken Ani, and by 1071, had pushed the Byzantines completely out of Anatolia. And the Caucasus, yeah. Everything. And the Caucasus. Yeah. Armenians still held on. The Turks came, but they didn't really establish dominance over People, the yeah. Caucasus, especially Sunik and Artsakh. Yeah. Um, because obviously, Artsakh was there before and after the Seljuks until 1261 as a kingdom no it's true it's always and that just goes to show like how like i don't know mountainous and like how difficult it was for them to really subjugate people yeah. in all over armenia but especially the sunik Artsakh I mean, area good luck getting a tr uh, like a wh horde of tribesmen on horseback uh, up a mountaintop uh, eight thousand feet in the air it's exactly why they were there in the first place on <laughs> exactly, that mountaintop yeah, and that's how they survived <laughs> and i mean uh, so like the, uh, compared to the rest of armenia and i'll probably make this point one or two more times the Artsakh sunik especially the Artsakh area they were the most independent semi-independent always autonomous oh yeah compared to almost most the rest of armenia uh they might have been conquered but they were never fully conquered you know up until today like yeah as we said in 1261 the mongols said you know what time to get rid of this kingdom make it a principality and it divided up into five principalities over time they refer to themselves as melik which means king in arabic the khamsa the khamsa, the khamsa, okay, khamsa which means which five, five in arabic melik, yeah. khamsa, the five kings even though they're most likely, you know, petty princes of small... They're lords. Yeah. They, they had, like, dominion over their part of Artsakh. Exactly. But, but those, like, same principalities are, like, the same regions we know today, right? Exactly. So the five principalities north of south would be Shahumyan, which was back then called Gulistan, mm -hmm. Jerabert, which was modern-day Mardagert, uh, Khachen, which is Askeran, including Stepanagert, Varanda, which became Marduni, and... Dizak. Dizak, my bad. <laughs> Dizak, which became Hadrut. Shushi was part of Varanda at the time. Shushi was not its own thing. Right. So these Meliks, these princes, you know, semi-independent, uh, while under the... Sorry, with the Mongols. Different tribes, yeah, yeah. Mo Mongols and the Karakoinlu, the Akkoinlu. Uh, which are like Turkic uh, Empire, whatever tribe groups. And then the Persians come back, right? They make a comeback. The Safavids, yeah. Um, and then or, were they or, still independent around under the Safavids? So the Safavids recognized the authorities of these Meliks in Sunik and in Artsakh. Yeah. But they wanted to weaken them. Right. So in the end of the 1590s and early 1600s, they began resettling different tribes there. For one, hundreds of thousands of Armenians were driven out of the Ararat Valley and the Arax River Valley. I was about to say, when they removed a lot of Armenians and took them exactly. to Isfahan or whatever. Yeah. Um, so from Yerevan, Arakadotan, Gergarguniksel, basically much of modern-day Armenia, except for Sunik and Tavush. Nach and Nakhichevan. Or no, I oh, mean, yeah. modern-day Armenia, Nakhichevan, plus northeastern Turkey, so Kars, yeah. Um, Alashkert, Beyazet. The Armenians regions. were depopulated and taken to Iran. Up to half a million. Armenians. Many died, right? I mean, half. Half of this crazy is insane. insane. Um, and so Armenia was depopulated at this point, and then a lot of other tribes were kind of moving in. Yeah, and we have record of this from Arakel Tavrizetsi, who's an Armenian writer in Tabriz. And he gave us a first hand you know, story of what happened. Um, and to replace these Armenians, they brought in Shia tribes because the Iranians had become Shia by this time. Um, Does that include Kurdish? And so like most were Turkic. Okay. Um, Turkic from what is historically Azerbaijan, northern Iran, right. were moved north across the Araks River. One major tribe were the Kangerli, which are a Khajar tribe. They settled in Yerevan, Nakhichevan, while the Afshars settled in Gharabagh. So one of the Afshar clans, the Javanshir clan, settled in the lowlands of Gharabagh, Smar de Agdam, and in the 1750s began their conquest of the mountains where the Meliks were. Right, so at one point these Meliks were they were stripped of their uh, power, and then they, they, these not were by the Iranians. I mean, even the Khan of Gharabakh who came to control the region in 1752, he still recognized the authority right. of these local Armenian princes. Yeah, he was intermarried with them and everything. Oh, yeah. He had like three Armenian wives. This guy was Palani, Palani, Pana Ali, Khan. Pana Ali Khan. Chris tried to help me with uh, remembering the name by saying Panali, which means key in Armenian. Close enough. Yeah, Panali. Uh, Armenians Khan. gave him the key to Gharapag when they, you know, gave him the fortress of Shushi. And these Meliks at this point were not Islamicized, but they had like a heavy uh, Islamic influence on their names and their the way they did things. Well, Some yeah. of them even had multiple wives because of this. Did you know that? 
the Maliks? Yeah, one of them. Shah, the, I think the main one, not Hassan Jalalian, but Malik Shah Nazarian. Uh, Malik Shah Nazarian. I mean, could I, be. It yeah. Sounds weird, but it was only one case where like one of them had multiple wives. But uh, th- when I first heard the name Hassan Jalalian, which is what is that a famous <laughs> Armenian family from there? The, it's the dynasty of Khachan. I was like Hassan and Jalal sound not very, very Armenian, Islamic. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but they have, there's Iyan. Well, so then okay. the thing is that these people had Islamic names because they were in the Islamic world, right? And they had, know, to <laughs> they had to survive. They had to survive, and I mean, I don't think they can pronounce Khosrovi Tukht in Arabia. Right. So Hassan is a lot easier, I guess. So the Medliks, they lost their, uh, they were still kind of a soft power in the area, but mm-hmm. then let's talk a little bit about uh, Pahla, Palani. Panali. Palani. Um, because it's attested that he was the one that tried to create this big fortress of Shushi, right? Yeah, Azerbaijani narrative is that you know Pana Ali was one who founded Shushi in 1752. Yeah, but here's the thing: we have records from before that. For one, in 1428, we have a manuscript being produced in Shushi, mm-hmm. and that's in Madan Taran. You can go see it. it says Shush. Yeah, <laughs> um, it existed before Pana Ali, um, and even the king of Georgia, Ereklis, in the early 1700s, again before they came, yeah, mentioned that there's a large fortress called Shushi in Gharabagh home to about 40,000 Armenian soldiers. So this thing has existed before this guy came. But like regardless <laughs> of that, like let's say they like the he gives the order and the finances to build this new fort. Definitely who, built a new fortress. Who was living around there? It was literally in the middle of the Armenian populated area of Artsakh, right? I mean, yeah, if you look at when the Russians came to the region, they took a census in 1823 and they found only a few, I believe seven Turkic villages out of like over 70 villages in the region. Yeah. So Shushi was their stronghold. Even the first Soviet census, you see about ten thousand Azerbaijanis in Nagorno Karabakh. About nine thousand lived in Shushi. Shushi. <laughs> you know, now I think about like uh, when like, I'm thinking about the Khan who and the you know gave out the order to make this new uh, fortress. Who built it? You know, who were the ones that went and had the stone masonry skills and said to like go in and you know build yeah. yourself a new city in this? And who were the first inhabitants when everyone around you uh, is Armenian and the we were basically running the merchants, uh, the 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 markets and the the trade between the towns? Uh, Shushi when it was first established, hundred percent, no no doubt. Hai Minasian's putting his name on it. There were Armenians living there from oh, day yeah. one. You oh, know that yeah. we were we were part of that population off the bat. Um, so. Um, moving forward, uh, it's an, uh, the Caucasus is mostly uh, owned by the Qajars, the, the, the Iranians, Iranians. And the, but the Russians are coming now. Oh, yeah. Right? Uh, when do the Russians come and what's happening? So, eastern Georgia, the kingdom of Kartli Kacheti, voluntarily gives up and says, Russia, take us. You know, because mm-hmm. they're fighting the Persians. 1096, the Persians came and burnt down Tbilisi. So, 1801, mm-hmm. eastern Georgia officially is annexed by the Russian Empire. 1813, again, another Russo-Persian War, Treaty of Gulistan, basically annexes most of modern-day Azerbaijan and Gharabagh to Russia. And then 1828, you have the Yerevan and Nakhichevan Khanates annexed by the Russian Empire following the Treaty of Turkmenchai. Mm-hmm. Um, what's interesting is that with the Treaty of Turkmenchai between Iran and Russia, Russia invites Armenians living in northern Iran to come resettle in these territories, which is modern-day Armenia. The Treaty of Turkmenchai is what they always bring up online. The, those uh, areas they that Arme- they, the Armenians were settled in these lands. They weren't always there. But what it it doesn't prove any. First of all, if you're a minority in a if you're a minority population, that doesn't negate the fact that you might not be indigenous or you are indigenous to the area. You know, a lot of parts of Western Armenia, the Armenians were no longer the majority population. That doesn't mean it's not their homeland. You know. Yeah. I mean, and we say Armenians were the minority. They were because of the forced migration of 1604. That as well, like a genocide that happened. And again, that they were the minority in that region. But in Artsakh, mountainous Karabakh, they were the absolute majority. Yeah, which is, the, again, like one of those unique things about Artsakh. It's, uh, it was the majority still in compared to the rest of Armenia. Artsakh and Sunik, as well as northeastern Armenia, so Tavush, yeah. maintain a very strictly Armenian majority. Yeah. Um, also, uh, Armenians from northern Iran and different parts were then, uh, so like yeah. some of them settled back into the Russian Empire side of things. So, roughly 40,000 came from northern Iran to Russian Armenia. There's also the Erzurumsis that went to Javakh and stuff. That happens the, the next year. Okay, later yeah. on. Yeah, so <laughs> with the 40,000 Iranian Armenians, roughly 35,000 settled in what became the Armenian Oblast, which is the Yerevan and Nakhichevan Khanates. Yeah. Basically, modern Armenia and Nakhichevan minus Sunik. Yeah. Um, about 5,000 settled down in Sunik or Zangezur, specifically in Sision. Okay. 
and only about 200 Iranian Armenian families settled down in Agorno Gharapakh, and they're from the Iranian city of Maragha, southeast of Lake Urmia, and they founded Nord Maragha. Mm. And I guess we'll talk about that another time where they were actually slaughtered in 1982. Right, the Maragha massacre, massacre. right? Um, yeah, so, uh, but at this point now, we have, let, let's look at the Caucasus right now, the mm -hmm. 1800s. You have Georgians, Armenians, Jews, Greeks, Turks. Now, the Russians called them Tatars. And from what I understand, the Tatar is just the, the Slavic term for Turkic people. You yeah, know, it's just catch-all term. It's, yeah, it's just a language thing. Um, but they referred to it as Tatars. Uh, so, But did the identity or the notion that these people were Azerbaijani exist at this point, you know? No, I mean, Azerbaijanis at this time still identified by clan. Right. So, Javanshir, Shah Sevan, Terekeme, Karapapak, um, Ayrum. It was only in 1880 where for the first time in a newspaper, the Azerbaijani nation is mentioned. But as the Azerbaijan in Republic of Azerbaijan or the Iranian Azerbaijan? So 1880 is also when pan-Turkism starts you know, coming that, about. Yeah, the idea. So by this point, the Azerbaijani nation was, like, I'm assuming, being referred to both people. So yeah. Shia, Muslim, Turkic-speaking people. In the eastern East Middle of East, the we'll Caspian. Say, yeah. West of the Caspian. West of the Caspian, my yeah, apologies. Yeah, no worries. Uh, east of Anatolia. West, West of the, the Caspian, Caspian, yeah. Um, because the term Azerbaijan is designated to the region of northern Iran, which is just the name of the province, Azerbaijan. You yeah. know? So it was the Turks that lived in Azerbaijan who then called themselves Azerbaijani. But, I, you know, they're geographically close to the Turkic people that lived in the Caucasus. And so I feel like over time, this identity kind of, uh, you know, got pulled over to the Caucasus as well. Yes, well, also many of the Turks of modern-day Republic of Azerbaijan, the, the Tatars of the Caucasus, their ancestors were simply brought over by the Iranians a few hundred years ago mm -hmm. during their, you know, when they're uh, doing policies. their own demographic thing. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, the fact that a lot of these people in the Caucasus had ancestors and relatives on the Iranian side because yeah. they were originally from there. That makes sense. So the fact that many of them called themselves Azerbaijani afterwards stems from the fact that they were actually from Azerbaijan and moved north. Moved north from there, and the other half were probably just locals who then, over time, uh, uh, yeah. you know, changed their identities. Like the based Shirvan on Shah people. The, the Shirvan, they're yeah. Persians, Tats. So that's yeah. the thing. The Shirvan Shah, like, who are they? What are they? The Shirvan region is basically the Islamic name for Caucasian Albania. Yeah. Um, and initially, Caucasian Albanian speaking, and then came Persian settlements throughout the Achaemenid and Sassanid era, and then came the Arabs, and then came some Kurds even mm -hmm. in the 10th century. And they all became Persianized, and their descendants would be the modern-day Tati or the Tats. Tats people, right? They're like a little yeah. north of Baku today, but well, they were a majority in Baku, They were right? a majority of Baku in the 1800s. When the Russians came, they said it's a town of 8,000 people. Almost all of them are Tats. There was only about 400 Armenians, about 5% yeah. of the city, and they had their own church built in 1795. Yeah. Um, so Armenians existed in Baku before the Russians came. But then at this point, when the Russians did take over, the Armenians started flooding... Uh, I mean, not, not only not when flooding, the Russians took over, but when oil was discovered in yeah. Baku. People from all over the Russian Empire, Germans, mm. Jews, I mean, Poles, even Estonians and Czechs. It was it was a developing at a fast pace, oh, you yeah. know, because of what the potential was there. And like two of the Armenians, the Gulbenkian and what was the other guy's uh, name? Mantashev. Like these two Armenians were actually pivotal, uh, instrumental in like a developing the oil industry there, both becoming billionaires for their time. Yeah. And like you'll see the Gulbenkian Foundation, they still uh, it's in Lisbon, don't, Portugal. Yeah, Lisbon, and there's a, they have a Gulbenkian museum there. Mm -hmm. He helped build like the part of the um, Armenian quarter in uh, Jerusalem, actually. Yeah. So, uh, so Armenians were instrumental in the in the oil industry, and the population was booming. Um, and then, they owned most refineries, actually, in the city. Yeah, which is interesting. It's ir ironic, also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so. Uh, Armenians are living in Artsakh. They're living in different parts of Azerbaijan at this point. Um, other big cities, there was a big population in Ganja. There was a big population in, um, uh, it's another town. Shamakhi, which Shamakhi. was the historical capital of Shirvan before Baku. You know, in, if we, we can give some context by looking at what's happening in Western Armenia at this point. Um, in the late 1800s, <coughs> Armenians there are... Uh, you know, have been mistreated for a long time and have begun to ask for equal rights, uh, you know, as yeah. a lack of a better term, or 
Human rights. Human rights. Like, you know, they want they want to live with dignity. And so there's actually a few partitions from Europe to help increase their autonomy or increase their rights, which were all kind of ignored by the Sultan and then ignored again by the Young Turks. So there is this kind of identity national awakening happening in Western Armenia, which was actually kind of fed from Eastern Armenia, the Caucasus also, yeah. to Tiflis being a big center for this national awakening for, awakening for Armenians and probably the other cultural groups. Yeah. But uh, the first real bloodshed, I think that uh, we can that's been that can be attested to directly being connected to what's happened this last century would be the 1905 Armeno Tatar War, as they're called. Um, could you give us some background and some of the details of what happened there? So yeah, 1905. Basically, there is a Russian Revolution, and people are protesting, and they establish a state Duma, so the parliament. But during this time, there's basically riots all over the Russian Empire in major cities, including Baku, mm -hmm. Tiflis, um, right. Elizabeth, Pol, Marde, Ganja, or Armenian Ganzak. Yeah. Um, even Nakhichevan and Shushi were not you know, spared destruction. But Baku, I feel like even up until 1991, was a very Russo-aligned -like, uh, city, oh, yeah. very closely connected to Moscow. Oh, and yeah. That makes sense. I know? mean, even in 1918, it was still controlled by Bolsheviks and Armenians. Yeah. Until the Ottomans came and helped the Azerbaijanis take the city. Take the city, yeah. But yeah, so 1905, the first act of violence happens in Baku between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. And by 1907, about three to 10,000 people were killed. And about 300 villages, Armenian and Azerbaijani villages, were destroyed. Um, so this was an inter-ethnic kind of like conflict. And it's the comparable to Lebanon during the civil war. Kind of two different groups fighting urban guerrilla warfare. Militia groups kind of going after each other. Crimes yeah. here, crimes there. And it just, I guess, tensions had built over the Russian Empire constantly favoring Armenians and constantly giving Armenians easier access to business. Yeah. While the Azerbaijanis, who had been the previously ruling class under the Iranians, the Turkic Khans, were kind of disenfranchised, for lack of a better term. No, it's true. Um, and, you know, where all their noble statuses were taken away. The, the Russians were not nice to the Muslims. If they weren't nice to anybody, they were definitely not nice to the Muslim population. They were population. not nice to anyone who was non-Orthodox right. Christian. Yes. Even Armenian uh, Meliks had their titles stripped. Even around this time, in the early 1900s, they were like took away our uh Church rights, right? Yeah, and which, I believe it's called Polozhenia, 1836. Was it earlier? Yeah, No, it was later on, too. Well, 1836, you know, they took away all the church-owned property. And then, but I remember, like, later on, because it was the Dashnags that went and, uh, went and like, tried to defend these churches as well. Maybe they That's tried a second time. That's in the 18, 1890s or 19, early, early 1903, 1903, 1903, actually, you're right. Yeah. So, I mean, the and Russians were not really kind. But to there was this perception, and it was true, be, or in a sense, it could be seen as, like, because Tiflis was, like, 80% Armenian at this point in, like, the late 1800s. 70, 70%. In the late 1800s or uh, mid-1800s, and Baku was, like, a, you know, even though Armenians were maybe not the majority population but we were really involved in the About industries and we were like the you know we were running business at this point and yeah they were getting uh nachans they were not nachans they were getting a <laughs> i mean jealousy is you know a word you can use but it was kind like, of anger and frustration yeah they were frustrated which is fair you know yeah of course and so uh you know the armeno tata war was definitely i think the most bloodiest kind of a precedent to the century coming after it. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's what led to this maybe divide in Eastern Armenia because for the longest time, these com communities could coexist and they were coexisting very well. Yeah. You know? um, but then, you know, the genocide happens, World War One happens, and that complicates things on another level because then the Armenians have this uh, attempt to become independent, mm -hmm. working with the Russians. Um, there's a genocide happening in, within the Ottoman Empire where uh, this new Turkish nationalism, this new Turkish identity, uh, a Turkey for the Turks is is on the rise. And, um, and as a result, Armenians have to fight for their survival. And this doesn't just limit itself to what's happening in the Ottoman Empire and in the Western Armenia, but um, it's connected throughout the historic homeland, throughout Eastern Armenia as well. Um, so 1918, both Azerbaijan and Armenia who actually a few years, a few you know months beforehand, with along with Georgia, were about to create a Trans-Caucasian Federation, actually yeah. like a united kind of uh, <laughs> confederation, which would have been definitely very interesting to see if it was successful. But then the Georgians backed out first. That's always the Ger Georgians, man. And then, uh, well, the Georgians and Azerbaijanis both backed down May twenty sixth at the same time. Armenians were in it 
We're going to confederation alone for two days until May 28th. <laughs> and then uh, I thought they were also made, Azerbaijan was May 27th, 28th or something. But uh, so the fe- confederation breaks down and now we have these three independent states who have all these territorial disputes. All of them. Yeah. <laughs> Armenia's fighting with Georgia. Georgia's fighting with Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan's, Azerbaijan's fighting with Armenia over Nakhichevan, uh, Sunik, and uh, Kharabakh par- par- in particular. Also like northeastern Tavush. That was with, I thought, with the Georgians. Both. Yeah. It I was, mean, it was mess. Tavush was part of the um, Ghazakh region of the Elizabeth Polk Gubernia. And so they were claiming so that. So they were like, well. oh, that's ours too. And we we're like, no. <laughs> and the Georgians were like, this is ours. And then is, we wanted Javakh. We were Lodi like, Lodi and Javakh were part of the Tbilis yeah. Gubernia. And the deal with that was they keep Javakh, we keep Lodi, Lodi. and Angpaman. Yeah, something like that. Even though both were overwhelmingly Armenian mm-hmm. majority regions. Yeah. Uh, but then, so uh, these independent countries with undefined borders basically are, you know, just basically uh, forcing their borders upon each other. Nakhichevan went back and forth, you know, at this point, right? Yeah, Nakhichevan was nominally under Armenian control, but was largely under the control of local Muslim warlords who were backed by uh, the invading Ottomans. Yeah, empowering. I mean, you have this power vacuum created by the Russian Empire's collapse in November 1917, and then comes winter. And then by February, March, in comes this massive Ottoman army trying to retake the yeah. Caucasus. Yeah, mm. we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on. <laughs> um, that's why you have the three battles against the Ottomans in May 1918. That we won, we won but somehow. <laughs> somehow we won, and but that was not the end. They came, they come back two years later. You guys, they came the, back, uh, yeah. But what's all, what's also interesting is that at this point in May 1918, the Turks not only are defeated, but they somehow circumnavigate Armenia and enter modern day Azerbaijan, right? To then Im- Im- encourage, to encourage this Turkish, this Turkish, 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 Turkish this, nationalism in Azerbaijan. I think it was to probably stay away, to keep them away from the, the Russians who were going to probably try taking it back, making it well, Bolshevik, yeah. right? Because again, these oil fields were probably Baku there. Baku was controlled by the what's called the Central Caspian Dictatorship, ruled by, I mean, some Azeris were involved in this project, but Russians, Armenians, Jews, Georgians, and Azeris. And they were kind of, you know, socialist, communist, and they didn't really care about ethnicities. Yeah. Um, these were like the upper echelon of Azerbaijanis who were very pro-Russian and did not care to be associated with, you know, the backwards Turk, quote unquote. I feel like this was this is a good um, example of what Baku was like and the the attitude there. It was very yeah. cosmopolitan. It was very European looking and uh, and very Russia looking. I mean, R- Russian was lingua franca of Baku until 1991, and Azerbaijanis only became the majority of Baku in the late 1970s. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, the city was like in the early 20th century was, I can say, a quarter Azerbaijani, a quarter Russian, a quarter Armenian, and then the other quarter was a mixture of everybody Germans, everybody. Jews, Georgians, Czechs, Poles. It was cosmopolitan. Even Persians from Iran. Yeah. Um, I speak with my Bakutsi Armenian friends and they'll tell you like, uh, you know, maybe it's because they weren't in the Armenian homeland in a sense and they were disconnected from their the land and this and that. But uh, it was they all speak Russian, oh, they, they, yeah, they, they, yeah. they barely speak Armenian and, uh, you know, this and that. And so it makes sense. This was something that carried on until 1991. Um, so 1918, uh, we controlled Artsakh, not officially, but uh, but de facto, or you know what I mean? So it's weird. Artsakh itself, Nagorno Karabakh, was under the control of the Karabakh National Council. So there were Armenian nas- Armenians love national councils. Yeah, we do. <laughs> um, so it was large in the control of the uh, Armenian National Council of Karabakh, but was militarily controlled at some points by the Brits. Yeah, they came who then in. handed power to Khosrovbek, who was a Turkified Kurd from Lachin. Yeah. <laughs> why are the why are the English there? You may ask. So because uh, the, the oil. oil oil man, there's oil there. Yeah, and the, what the English said was, this was their plan. Take the Russian imperial borders of the provinces and make those into states. So basically, the Erivan Governorate Gubernia become Armenia, along with parts of the Kars Oblast. Elizabeth Pol or Ganja Gubernia Governorate would become part of Azerbaijan along with Baku. So Sunik and Gharapagh Artsakh were part of the Elizabeth Pol Governorate. And Britain wanted to make sure these stay part of Azerbaijan. And the but locals God, were like, no. Garaginej just said no. Yeah. <laughs> and he fought in those mountains, actually, in the Zangezur. And oh, yeah. I mean, Arso- Sunik survived as an independent country until 
July or August 1921. Yeah, because <laughs> the Bolsheviks came through, they took over the major part of Armenia, but Kariki Nizhda did not give up. He was the he's an ARF member and Armenian general, and for a number of months in the mountains of Sunik, he fought off yeah. the invaders. Well, what happened was at this point it was November 1920. The Ottomans invaded round 2. Right. And the Russians had just taken Azerbaijan in August of 1920. So the Russians are coming in from Noyambedian, from Tavush, and entering south to Kotak into Yerevan. Um, and that's November 29th. December 3rd, Armenia officially capitulates and says, you know what? Bolsheviks are better than it's another genocide. communism over genocide. Yeah. Um, so that's when Armenia becomes communist. But they weren't going to give Zangezur Sunik to Armenians, and that's why I think he stuck it out there yes. until they said, fine, we'll give so you well, Zangezur. Yeah, the Russians, I mean, they took Yerevan in December 1920. But not the rest of the country. And then in February 1921, you have the February revolt or uprising. Right. Where Kicked them out for a little bit. Yeah, the Armenians took the ARF, led this you know, new group, and they took back most of the Republic of Armenia, um, eventually lost it to the Russians. But they held out in Sunik, Vyotsod, and parts of Artsakh until July or August 1921. So right. for months they held out until they agreed that if Sunik remains part of Armenia and under that treaty, Gharagi Nishta and his followers agreed to move to Iran. Yeah, like it just escaped south. And then yeah. what happened with uh, Artsakh now? Were, were they guaranteed some sort of autonomy? or? Um, so it's a little more complex because Artsakh and Armenians and Azerbaijanis were not in the best state. You know, in March 1918, when this communist dictatorship was ruling over Baku, the local Azerbaijanis were revolting. And the local communist Bolshevik authorities, with the help of the Armenians, basically suppressed this revolt brutally, and roughly right. twelve thousand Muslims were killed. Yeah, which I mean, they, which they like, you know, feel really like they attest to this massacre as being something that the Armenians did to them. Yeah, and they call it genocide, uh, which it's uh, really uh, not. But it's uh, it's important for us to know that this is Black January, or what do they uh, call it? The March days. March days. So this was the March Days Massacre, correct, where, uh, you know, Muslims were suppressed violently, thousands of them dying, and the Azerbaijanis look at this as, this again, like this Russian-Armenian collaboration to uh, hurt the Azeris. Um, yeah. So, and then it's important to know because this is part of their psyche today, and this is exactly. part of their it's identity. Been, you, know, you know, blown out of proportion in terms of the Azerbaijani <laughs> national narrative. And in response to this, when the Ottomans invaded Baku in September 1918, a few months after, they wiped out the like September Days Massacre, yeah. where about 30,000 Armenians were killed. Yeah. In a way more brutal fashion. The Ottoman army actually said, for two days, we'll stay outside the city walls and let Bashi or, you know, right. irregular militants go in and storm the Armenian quarters. Slaughter. Yeah. yeah. And about of the 80,000 Armenians, 30,000 were killed, 20,000 were expelled and fled yeah. from the, to the Caspian Sea across the Central Asia it's and to Iran. Yeah. So, uh, so let's talk to the Bolsheviks. Going or, back to yeah. Artsakh, I guess. How yeah. does this tie to Artsakh? So Armenians obviously don't feel safe living under Azerbaijani rule because you yeah. saw what happened in Baku. Mm -hmm. And then that was September 1918. In June 1919, again, another massacre of Armenians near Stepanagat in four different villages. Out of nowhere, again, for absolutely no reason. But why not? Slaughter Armenians, you know? Mm -hmm. And then March 1920. This is a few months before the Russians take over Azerbaijan. There is an attempted military revolt against the Azerbaijani military in Shushi. Because again, Artsakh was controlled by Armenians politically, but there was a military occupation of the Azerbaijanis stationed in Shushi. So in March 1920, basically the Azerbaijani army destroys Shushi, burns it down, and massacres about 20,000 Armenians who then formed the majority of the city. There's insane pictures. Oh, yeah, of Shushi like, is a like turn to rubble. Yeah, it's and a lot of the rubble that you see today in Shushi is even from that time when it was burnt down originally. Yeah, and Shushi never recovered. I mean, this was March 1920, and it was in 1923 where Stepanagert was built in a valley below as a new city because Shushi became a ghost town. And after this, it became majority Azerbaijani. But never like even the size of what it was before. Before it was huge. It was and over 50,000 people. And so one of the largest cities in the Caucasus. And afterwards, it was touching 10,000 maybe. like Azif, barely. Yeah, barely. Um, um, only in the late Soviet era did it hit like 12, 12, yeah. 12 13, 14,000. Yeah. Um, and even that was basically because Azeris who had been living outside of Shushi and Gharabakh were flooding into Shushi because the war was beginning. And it was their stronghold. Right. Where they can bomb Stepan, I guess. That makes from. sense. Well, so, um, Gharabakh has this Armenian political 
kind of like control yeah. but then uh these some these little massacres are happening this is 1920 just before the bolsheviks are coming a few months um, before a few yeah. months beforehand um and so they'll say let's say the bolsheviks take over the whole caucasus azerbaijan armenia sunni Karabakh. Uh, what were the like you know how did they determine the borders and then what happened with Karabakh? so initially before the russians bolsheviks took over armenia they had already taken over azerbaijan and they had promised, alongside with Azerbaijani leaders, that Nakhichevan, Sunik, and Artsakh, east to west, would become part of the new Soviet Armenia. So that's one of the reasons why Armenians were like, you know what, this might not be too bad. If they give us those three. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because we controlled them nominally, and Sunik militarily, mm-hmm. Nakhichevan was going back and forth, and Artsakh was, you know, we just explained what the situation yeah. was there. Um, but here's the thing. 1921, by this point, Nakhichevan, which had been 40% Armenian, had been wiped clean of Armenians, mm-hmm. barely 10%. A referendum held in early 1921 shows that 90% of the population in Akhichivan voted to become part of Azerbaijan. Mm-hmm. It became an autonomous republic of Azerbaijan under the guarantee ship of Turkey. Sunik obviously became part of Armenia, retained its Armenian majority, and is you know an integral part of the Republic of Armenia today. Then there's Artsakh. They said, what do we do with this thing? I mean, you know. So they said, <laughs> let's do this. In 1923, it was decided that it would become an autonomous oblast, meaning an autonomous province. So it's not at the same level as Nakhichevan is, as a republic, but it's a province. Okay. Um, I don't know why they didn't give it equal status. And when we say who, do we mean Joseph Stalin? <laughs> so it's, ob- it's often said, that, oh, Joseph Stalin, divide and conquer, gave Artsakh to the Azadis. But if you look at Artsakh, its economy was actually tied eastwards. Yeah, to the plains of modern day Azerbaijan. Mm. So some say that the reason why they actually gave Nahi, I mean, Nagorno Karabakh to Azerbaijan was because economically. It was economically tied to the region. The shepherds would go up and down the mountains, would go east to west. They wouldn't go to Armenia. West of Artsakh, it's just more mountains. <laughs> yeah, if, if it made sense, like if it was easy or convenient to, con- to connect to Armenia, maybe it would have been. Yeah. But from what, uh, but uh, what happened was. You know, it was told it was going to be given to Armenia, however, and then the next day they changed their mind and then yeah. signed it over to the uh, to, to Azerbaijan. Like, forget the geographical kind of uh, issue there. It was, there was a big pressure from Turkey to, you know... Uh, always Turkey. It's always Turkey, Ottoman Empire getting involved in the Caucasus, creating these problems with Azerbaijanis and Armenians at the end of the day. Um, they wanted Azerbaijan to be Turkic and they wanted it yeah. to be as big as possible. And, uh, you know, th- th- Joseph Stalin or the Soviets are thinking, you know, let's keep Ataturk in you know, our good graces. Let's keep him happy. Maybe he'll join our team one day. And so they change their mind a day yeah. later. So the other, gave- the other theory besides geographically and economically is that it was done in order to placate Turkey because the Russians not only gave Artsakh to Azerbaijan, they also gave... Artvin and southern Ajara from Georgia to Turkey. They gave Kars, Ardahan, and Igdir, Mardi Ararat, yeah. also from Armenia to Turkey. So the Russians really said, anything to make you happy, Turkey. Yeah, like don't put pressure on us over Don't here. worry, we got you. We'll take care of your Turkey kin yeah, here in the Caucasus. And th- I mean, it, it makes sense. and uh, Because there were no other communist countries. There were no allies for Russia. So Russia was doing everything possible to... Make friends. And especially at that time, after everything they just went through, World War One and this and that, any sort of external pressure could break the whole thing, and they yeah. didn't want that. Um, and so they played politics with our borders and with our people, and this kind of set up the future for the region. You know, a, a 90% per populated Armenian region being given to the Azerbaijani SSR, even though it was autonomous, um, it wasn't completely autonomous. Joseph Stalin... Uh, who is the, what was his commission name? What was his job? He was like the commissar of ethnic minority. Maybe to appease Ataturk, maybe because of economic reasons and like infrastructure reasons, he signed over Artsakh to um, to Azerbaijani Soviet Socialist Republic, even with a 90% um, uh, population percentage uh, of, Armenians. of Armenians. And then can you give us a little bit of what happened next, very simply, after it was signed over to them? I mean, after it was signed over, you have eventually the depopulation of the region. So the Armenian population of Artsakh barely grew during the Soviet era. However, the Azerbaijani population grew four f- times. <laughs> right. Um, They're moving in. They were, it was, there mean, was pro-Azeri policies. Yeah, I mean, Heydar Aliyev was instrumental in resettling Azerbaijanis in the region. 
not only this, but a lot of other Muslim minorities, like the Kurds of Kalbajar and Lachin, or Pertsora and Karvajar, were reorganized in t- and reclassified as Azerbaijanis. So anything to make this region not Armenian was done. The Armenian genocide in 1915 needs to be recognized by Turkey and Azerbaijan if Armenians and their heritage are to survive within their borders. How can the societies of our neighbors accept and respect the rights of Armenians in Artsakh in the Armenian highlands if their history is denied, and as a result, it denies their right to exist, the right to be who they are, proud Armenians of Artsakh. Artsakh has played a core role in the history of our nation from the beginning until today. When the independence of an Armenian state became a reality in 1918, the Armenian majority of Artsakh wanted to be a part of it. They fought to be a part of it. They voted and cried to be one with their people. But in the end, they were consistently denied this wish of theirs. And so they fought for it. For much of our history, even up till today, the rights of the Armenians on their homeland is subject to the whims and geopolitics of the empires that surround us. Inaccurate and arbitrary borders intended to complicate and divide the populations have contributed to the mess that we are in today. In 1988, they voted peacefully, which was met with massacre. In 1991, they voted for independence, which was met with an Azerbaijani army and more massacres. And then the Artsakhsi fought for their rights, fair and square, outgunned, outmanned, and they won themselves an independent nation. Unrecognized, but true in any other way. An independent Artsakh. The Artsakh struggle is the Armenian story, the story of survival, persevering against all the odds, a people who carry the many characteristics of what it means to be Armenian, including the stubbornness to never give up, to never give up on their rights to exist in their homeland, and their rights as human beings to live with dignity and respect. For myself, as an Armenian whose family had to escape from Western Armenia during the genocide, Artsakh had become a symbol of hope for many of us who lost our historical homelands throughout Western Armenia. The victory in the 90s was a huge morale boost to our traumatized psyche of victimhood and defeat. It empowered us as a people and as a nation and filled ourselves with hope. So to lose Artsakh, is to lose hope for our future and past. And with whatever happens next, and as romantic as this all might sound, I will not give up on our hope, Artsakh. The story of Artsakh will not end here. It will continue, and it will be learned about and talked about for years and centuries to come, just like we did today. You have been listening to Haituk Talks, the official podcast of the AYF West. I am Haig Minasyan. I am Christopher Khachadur. And we're just a couple of Armenians talking in the world. A couple of Armenians talking in the world. Go ahead. Try to destroy them.